Hello, everyone, and welcome to Emotionally Engaging Attendees in the New Era of Events. We are excited to have the opportunity to partner with Cadence to bring you this event. My name is David Adler. I'm the founder and chairman of BizBash and your host and moderator for today's event. Today, we'll be talking about how many event professionals are finding new ways to engage attendees by focusing their emotions and senses. What does event personalization look like in today's world? And what are the best kept secrets behind the energetic, unique event experience? We are here with industry experts to uncover just that. I would like to invite all participants to add your questions into the chat as they come, and we will address them during the last 15 minutes of our session. Also, don't forget to check out the live feed on the main event website. But before we jump in, I'd like to introduce the CEO of Cadence, Michael Buckley. And don't forget to stay afterwards because he's gonna give you an exclusive demo of the Cadence platform. So Michael, let's start off to tell a little bit about what Cadence is and how you are tackling this actual mission of emotionally engaging attendees virtually. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for having us, David. Uh, so with Cadence, uh, you know, we began as an in-app in, in uh, platform uh, for in-person events. And obviously now with the transition to virtual, you know, we really kind of worked to be able to ensure that we could bring that same level of energy and excitement to the virtual space. And uh, our company's tagline is experience every moment. And a large reason for that is we want to be able to help event professionals create emotionally engaging events that do make memorable, uh, you know, memories and, and memorable uh, events that are remembered for quite a while. So really, really excited for today's uh, panel discussion uh, with some of these wonderful thought leaders uh, about uh, the ways that we go about emotionally engaging attendees. You know, you know, Michael, before we start, I would love to hear what was the most emotional moment you've ever had at an event? Like what gave you goosebumps? And because I know that you got to model all this technology around how you can somehow recreate that, that feeling, especially on the screen with both of us. Any right. other things that come to mind? Uh, actually quite a bit, uh, of course, but um, a, a ton recently uh, in virtual events too. Um, I think over the last 18 months, I've probably cried over a dozen times during, uh -huh. virtual, which is quite unusual, I would say. Um, I think a lot of the emotional development uh, workshops that I've done um, are the ones that have spurred quite a bit of that like emotional connection. I think part of that is the format, of course, um, when you get to all be part of the conversation and share. I think a large part of that is um, the, the storytelling. You know, these are real people's experiences that get shared that might resonate with each one of us um, or just give different perspectives. Those are the ones that have really made me at the end of the event reflect consistently about what I just experienced, but then also share and tell all those stories to everyone in my life, um, which I'm sure is what the event organizers really hope is the outcome of any really truly successful event. So we should have distributed Kleenex to the group yeah, yeah. before we started. Um, so what was some of the things that made you cry in a virtual event? That's kind of, you know, you talked about your, 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 that experience you had. What was it? Like dig a little deeper, tell us. Sure, well, I think it's twofold. Um, one is when, you know, everyone wants to feel understood often um, and uh, kind of feel heard. And uh, there was a, quite a bit of that in this event where when people have shared experiences that you have or shared perspectives, one that does really connect you to them and, and that can kind of start to forge some of those emotions occurring. Um, but it's also on the other side too, where it's a completely different perspective and, and something that is not something that I have experienced myself and others are sharing it um, that also have develops that empathy and that understanding that can lead to a lot of those emotional moments that occur. So what you're doing is if you created the platform for us to tell these stories, but you know, it's, it's still up to the people that we're gonna hear next to tell us how they use it to create those emotional moments. Because I think that is the holy grail of, of connecting with people. And, and, and I have to say, not to um, uh, toot my own horn, which I hate doing, but I think that the idea of being a good moderator is a big part of that. And I think that planned out, a lot of times people think they can just open the camera and it's gonna happen. Uh, we all know, especially the people that are gonna be in this group, 
that it really is every moment is really planned, even the spontaneous ones. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that we do really focus on with Cadence is ideally for these event curators, you know, the people that are putting on these world class events, how best can we allow them to really focus just on the content and the experiences and not the other aspects of how do I create registration or create my schedule or upload content? Um, a lot of those components allow these event professionals just to really focus on what matters most, which are these kind of organic and uh, planned kind of conversations and formats. And you don't want it to start, you know how, you know how when you know it's going to go wrong when all of a sudden you're on a Zoom call and the CEO or the head of the company is on mute and they start going and they're so nervous from that point on. Right, of course. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, so why don't we get into it right now? Uh, let's bring in um, the other panelists, and I will introduce them individually, and they're all teed up also to tell us their goosebump moment at events, virtually or in person. So let's bring them all on. Here we go. We got the whole Brady Bunch group. Um, first, uh, let's start with Alexander, Alexandra Rembach, the founder and creative director of Sterling Engagements in Los Angeles. Wave to everyone, Alexandra. So people know who you are. There you are. And then we're go I'll go back and we'll ask each other a question. We have Austin Johnson, the CEO and founder of AK Johnson Group. Austin Knight Johnson. We, we talked about his name, which was very <laughs> cool. And, and Nathan McCourt, Director of Technical Operations at the Van Wagner Production Group. And so why don't we start with Alexandra? Tell us a little bit about what Sterling Engagements in Los Angeles is, does, and what was your first goosebump moment at events where you know you love this business too. It doesn't have to be professionally, it could be just in general. Sure, um, so I founded the company about 16 years ago. We are a full service creative firm specializing in events, experiential. We do everything across the board from corporate entertainment, uh, brands, we even do a small degree of social, uh, everything from weddings and mitzvahs and everything more. Uh, when I built the company, I knew that I never wanted to do one specific niche in the industry. I really love being able to have kind of a versatile kind of collective of different events that we do. And I have a great team that supports us in being able to kind of satisfy different areas of the market. I would probably say that for me, the wow moment was pretty early on. Um, <clears throat> I think I was interning for um, a person that I used to work for. And I remember it was the end of the event. It was like an 18 hour day. And at the time I was majoring in broadcast journalism, <laughs> driving home after 18 hours. And I was just literally like smiling ear to ear high off the experience. It was my first big event. It was the TV guide Emmy after party. And, um, it was just such a cool moment to be a part of something from start to finish. I think I was 18 years old and I just knew that I was meant to do this. And then, you know, fast forward many moons later when we did our first Emmy post party for Fox, um, that moment kind of reshaped itself to being able to be like, wow, this is the very event that got me into the industry is an Emmy after party. And now here I am producing one on my own. Um, so that moment kind of resurfaced in a different way where it wasn't me just processing the industry as a whole, but was processing how far I'd come over the last, you know, 18 years at that point. Um, so um, I think that I personally have moments like that almost every event that we produce in some specific way i just happen to be a very emotional person and very sentimental and super detailed and that comes across and a lot of the ways that we connect with our clients and the events that we you know curate and produce but um i think each one really does have its own moment within us as the producers where we have that moment whether it's at doors or at the client reaction or you know something as simple i remember i think it was back in october of last year, we did a virtual event and we brought in um, some musicians that were performing for this virtual event. And just thinking to myself as they're performing, what a big deal it is to have all the crew that was there and all the musicians that were there to give them work in a time when everything was so stopped. Um, it totally made me teary eyed. So I think there's so many different moments that have happened over the last year now more than ever. And I think more than anything, we're feeling them so differently because our eyes are so open. So hold that thought a little bit because I wanna pull out of you, how do you orchestrate this in a way that's, that you actually know how to plan these moments? But, we're, but hold that thought. 
Uh, let's go to Austin Johnson. And Austin, you've been doing incredible work, uh, award-winning stuff all over all over the world. And uh, we want to know a little bit about your company and also what your first moment was that made you say, this is where I want to be. So I'll give you that weird uh, uh, full circle moment for me, which is quite a while ago, actually. So I started AK Johnston 13 years ago. And my very first, I think, exposure moment was actually walking the track of the Jurassic Park ride in 93 when they first came out with that. And that was arguably one of the most immersive uh, kind of experience based uh, theme park attractions um, that it kind of opened up. And after seeing that, I moved my focus from wanting to do film and television into like this theme park thing. But how do you make money off of making a theme park? I mean, what, what, a, what a kid like job to want to make a theme park. And so I kind of put shelved that and started an event company uh, when I was in high school, um, oddly enough. And I had a business partner. Um, and then we, uh, I don't know, we just kind of hacked away and made it work. So people always ask, is this always what I wanted to do? And the answer is oddly, yes. It's kind of weird. In fact, like in third grade, I asked Santa Claus for like a chop saw and I got a chop saw underneath the Christmas tree. So this is kind of just a full circle thing for me to be in this industry now. Thank God I'm making money doing it. I mean, holy shit. It was so many years of like trying to make it work, you know. Um, but we are finally, uh, we're, we're doing good stuff now. In fact, we just were, um, we built a lot of the Avengers campus for Disneyland. Uh, and that was kind of a full circle moment for me just recently. Uh, and a lot of stuff for the Walt Disney Company was kind of full circle for me because that was kind of where my heart was at. Um, but really, you know, as the world reopens, it's just about working with clients and and just doing cool stuff. I mean, I, I, I love working with like a, a branded product that seems so boring and bringing it to life in really memorable, odd ways and TV shows to life in, in experiential ways and immersive ways. Um, and even adapting some of our business into the virtual space, like for Amazon.com doing their virtual events. We actually launched a new company for Amazon.com called Explore. And it's about the experience economy in a consumable uh, retail uh, e-commerce platform like manner. So that was kind of cool for us and um, without losing our, our core of our business. Well, hold those thoughts. Yeah. Um, and we're gonna, we want to get into giving people sort of the tools so that they can do this. But I do want to ask you one question first. Were you as good of a boss in high school that you are now? I was a way better boss in high school because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have uh, a couple of attorneys and I didn't have an HR department. So that was probably uh, additive to the experience. <laughs> okay, good, good. So Nathan, uh, tell us what your company does and what you learned. What was your big goosebump moment? How do you decide you wanted to be in this industry? Thanks, David, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us here today. Uh, we're really excited to kind of talk through this. Um, Van Wagner Productions is kind of a uh, all-encompassing event agency, and that we're not necessarily we don't necessarily call ourselves an agency, but more of a group because we're just like a group of people that really love events and and, and love uh, really bringing those moments to life for people. Um, kind of to to backtrack a, a couple of, or a year or two ago, I mean, we were really focused in the sports and entertainment. Uh, market specifically, um, from the Olympic Games to the Super Bowl to really any marquee event in the sports world, uh, providing uh, production for those different events. Um, and when the pandemic hit uh, over a year ago now at this point, um, kind of the light went off that we've been doing a lot of this hybrid kind of virtual stuff in the sports market uh, at real events for a number of years. But it was kind of like a realization that there's all of these other opportunities out there where we can service a lot of other clients in different markets by bringing their events to a hybrid nature or bringing them to more people in a digital fashion. So that's really where a lot of our focus has been um, in the last year plus um, in, in trying to bring more of those moments that um, may happen at a conference behind closed doors, per se, to a wider audience um, through video production and, and other elements like that and trying to engage a wider audience, but still keeping like the core of, of that event on-premise experience now. And, and I think what we're going to see is a really boom in, in those hybrid style events where you have uh, something happening on an on-premise basis, but also engaging a wider audience through, through digital and virtual fashions. Um, what are some of the sporting uh, clients that you've worked on? on? Um, so, on? yeah, I, and actually kind of my aha moment is, is in the sports uh, world due to due to that fact. But uh, it was really my first Super Bowl. And uh, this year will be 
my 10th, um, which is crazy. You know, growing up as a kid, you, you never, as a, as a sports fan, even think that you'll ever go to one of these things. And here I am, uh, about to turn 30 this year and embarking on my 10th Super Bowl. So I think really it was, it was game day, um, back well, 10 years ago now walking into the stadium and just like the aura that that event has uh at least for for people in in, in north american sport and in the nfl being kind of the creme de la creme in the in the sports market uh industry um it was kind of just like this is so cool um i never thought i'd be at one of these things and and now here we are 10 years later uh it's really really exciting to to be partnering with with a client like that and entrusted by a client like that to deliver uh and, and having a long-standing relationship that that we have as a company i mean i think company-wide this is over 30 years of working with the nfl um so uh it's really cool and they've they've turned to us in the last uh last year or so um kind of through the pandemic and whatnot on new ways to engage their historically on-premise events around the league, uh, be it the the draft um, last spring that was a completely digital event, um, kind of right at the start of the pandemic where all the leagues had shut down. Um, there was really not that entertainment value in a lot of people's lives that they've become accustomed to. And, and that event, at least for for like the diehard kind of football fans, but I think really for sports fans in general in the event world was kind of like a breath of maybe we can get through this thing, even though it was so early on now, looking back a year later uh, and coming out of uh, this year's NFL draft being done in a, in a true hybrid environment where we did have that on-premise footprint, um, but also had cameras and, homes of 40 plus prospects and had video feeds flying all around the country and actually all around the world. So those kinds of things I think are, are really unique and, and really cool in that market. Do you think that that's going to be, what is the, the, you know, we're all sort of, as we said earlier in our pre-show here, that we're all planning in real time. We're still flying the airplane while it's in the air. Do you think that, uh, that the hybrid piece that you learned from last year is going to be, part of the regular world or will it be different than what you did last year? I, I think anything in the digital virtual space is so ever growing and so fastly morphing into new things at such an incredibly fast rate. I mean, at least for in the, in the broadcast industry alone, where we do some focus of our work, just the technology that's become available in the last 18 months is, things that we never would envision have tried to do pre-pandemic. So I know we we often focus on a lot of the bad things that have been in our lives for the last year plus, but I think a lot of really, really cool and good things have come to the forefront. And I do think that that, that hybrid event style of any sort, be it in the sports market or be it in the corporate market, a product launch, anything is really a new way to engage a wider audience than just an on-prem event. Give us one thing that people that are listening today will say, I want to do that with this new technology that you're talking about. What have you seen that uh, is going to be a whiz bang thing that people need to know about that uh, they need to ask for? Because you know everything is moving so fast we don't even know where to get the information to know what to ask. Yeah, I mean, I think the ability to connect people uh, in a in a digital fashion, regardless of where they are, is become so easy to do. As as crazy as that may be to say, but I think that there's no in that realm. There's no crazy, wild, stretched idea of oh, we want to have our events spread across four markets across the world, but all interact with each other. Those are things that are really easily accomplished now. And I think that we can kind of start to think out of the, out of the box in that fashion and, and, and not have to have one ballroom in one city, but maybe we have four ballrooms in four cities and they're all interacting and engaging with each other um, in new fashion. So I think things like that are, are going to be new ways to think about how do I host my event in a hybrid fashion that has a digital component, has a virtual component, and maybe spreads a 
a broader blanket across the audience. So Austin, let's go to you. What do you think is going to happen next of something that you've seen possible, but you haven't yet done uh, in terms of helping people think about what to look for, what to ask for? So I think um, it, it, I'm going to fall on a sword with how I was advising clients. And I don't think it's necessarily negative. I just think it's uh, how we progress through uh, p satisfying uh, the audience's desire for stuff, right? Uh, so we came from experiential, high touch, right? And then we hit a pandemic. So now we're like, okay, how do we do this? And so my approach historically with our clients that we took digital was to create these immersive environments because the word immersion, uh, you know, immersive immersion, that's, that's really critical of why I don't love virtual. Right. And so, so, so we kept designing these websites, these microsites that told the experience, there was a photo booth over here and there was some surprise and delight over here. And there was graphical plays there. But I do think that as a note moving forward, that people should shy away from that because I was spending $100,000 of a client's money to create microsites and then do like, you know, a combination pre-recorded in vMix style, you know, outputs, that kind of thing. But I think where we're headed is back to the in real life experiential where there's a beautiful set, we're in a beautiful ballroom or we're in a place that has a providence to it, right? We're in a destination, right? And maybe that room of 1000 is now 200 and our virtual audience can use a platform similar to Cadence. And the reason why that's important, I'm not just plugging it because I've, you know, to be respectful of the partner here, but I think that it's about that simplicity of interface where they can connect and they can chat and we can see each other and it's reliable and we can see whose name is on screen, you know, at any one time. Like these features are more like a keep it simple, stupid, you know, kind of environment. And you want reliability and you want, you want, you don't want to explain it too much. So I think that what we should be looking for in the future is to go back to our original thinking of designing immersive, sexy staging and cool rooms and these kind of things, but also have them be uh, have them use a digital component where it's plugged in, but really simply. Whereas historically speaking, I've been telling clients, let's get more cameras in there, let's bring a DJ in, let's do this microsite. I don't think that people want that anymore. They're going to want to either pay the extra money, the higher ticket price to attend in person and go to Tampa, ah. or they're going to want to go for a cheaper ticket and they're going to want to attend and just digest the content as simply as they can. And I think that that's the magic. I think that where I was kind of putting our clients is right in the middle of those two worlds. And I think you're going to see that people are going to want to polarize it. Really, really, really in-depth, expensive in person, complemented with a really, really simple and reliable uh, virtual broadcasting tool. Interesting. Alexandra, what do you say as what is the, the question kind of was, it's morphing into what's going to happen next. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit with Austin. I think that we are in a place right now where it's kind of like this temporary normal of continuously developing and continuously figuring out what that is as we move from, you know, month to month, day to day, even week to week. I think that what we're advising clients is really about how to get back to in person entirely. And part of that process is this hybrid feel. And for us, I think that it's about how to deliver an experience that people will feel connected both virtually and in person. It's obviously a lot easier when you're in person and you have, you know, like what Austin was saying, the sexy staging and all these kind of moments that people can feel. But for the people that are at home that are tuning in and are coming in virtually to be able to use a platform and still deliver an experience that keeps them connected where they're not just tuning in and looking at a screen. What we're trying to focus on is the details. We're trying to focus on ways that we can make people feel just as connected in real life at home. So giving them some unique kind of personal details that maybe they won't get in person, whether it's an exclusive access to a green room that as they come off an award stage, they'll be able to have some real time with, you know, whoever just won the award or moments that in between things, they get some sort of tidbit of entertainment that might not be happening on site. I think what we're trying to do most right now is try to bridge the gap that people that aren't there can still feel just as much surprise and delight as those that are on site. And that's, that's a, really been our focus. Michael, what do you think? You're the one, you're talking to a lot of people who are trying to understand this new hybrid world. Are what you're hearing, does it make sense to uh, the other feedback that you're getting? Yeah, well, you know, one thing, I, I definitely agree with Alexandra as well about that, that the connections are going to be such a huge component of when you are virtual or in person. But I, I consider myself uh, to be a little bit introverted, right? So even when I was going to in-person events all the time, let's say even it was a thousand people, 
I might have sometimes only met five to 10 people um, because maybe I haven't felt as comfortable to go out there and talk to the other, you know, 995. So um, I might just be sitting next to whoever I, I'm with in the grand ballroom and maybe I spark a conversation with the person to my left or my right or go to the bar and get a few drinks and then the social lubricant opens up a little bit. But um, I think it's really important from the, like the content creators or the event creators, even when in person, how can you have some sort of formats that do connect people a little bit more? And then obviously on the technology side, we're thinking about that quite extensively of whether it's conversations, whether it's virtual viewing along with the people that are there in person, how can you share the experiences as best as possible from who's there virtually, who's there in person. Um, one of my favorite festivals, of course, is Coachella. And when I'm there live, yes, it has every facet of the beautiful sound, the lighting, the feel of everything that's around there, the number of people. And when I'm there in person, I'm wondering what it's like to be observing this from a distance online. And I would love to see that become a lot of the component of, man, what did it look like when uh you know if it was cascade when i was there i could see afterwards like a month later what that looked like um from a visual standpoint of 150,000 people but i'd love to be there live in person and actually see what that is like from the the virtual experience um or vice versa i'm, I'm participating virtually and i really get an understanding of what it's like to be there in person uh i'd love to really kind of see that be the next evolution of what this hybrid experience will be so, so, Michael, just a, a really quick point there that's kind of interesting to think about, um, it, and only because I'm really connected with Coachella. It, did you know that this is YouTube's, it'll be YouTube's 10th year broadcasting? It's one of the first festivals to be broadcast. And I think that you've identified a really critical point is it's not necessarily about having the access. It's about the market's willingness to accept it, right? It's like widescreen TV, 69 aspect ratios came out 10 years before people were buying widescreen TVs largely in the public space. And so you, 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 you touch on an interesting point there. It's like we can have the tools to do something, but if the market has to show interest as well, too, because a lot of people have the same thing that you just said. Somebody said to me, the other day, oh, the first time ever they're going to they're going to broadcast Coachella on YouTube. I said, no. <laughs> this is their 10th year doing it <laughs> and that, that started 12 years ago and that's kind of sad to say and see because we spent i've seen i've seen some of these bills about how much money we spent on cameras and broadcasts and triax feeds and fiber optics in that on that field and i'll tell you i mean to hear that is got to be gut-wrenching for youtube <laughs> so. <laughs> so let me let me bring it back to another thing um what it sounds like if i can interpret what you're saying and i i think that this is like the holy grail of events is how do you scale intimacy how do you make people feel if you're introverted that you can have a conversation or that you get to peek behind the scenes that no one else is doing because you're using the virtual tools, the new canvas? The question is for both all of all of you, how do you plan that? How do you plan more than just the epic look and feel? And does the epic look and feel contribute to the intimacy or does it make you not feel intimate? So whoever wants to go with that sort of line of discussion like take people through how to I, do it. I think something that can be unique with regards to kind of the uh, combining the, the two worlds is a lot of the times, uh, let's just look at like a VIP type experience, right? So you have however many VIPs may buy a, a VIP style ticket to an event, but how many, what add on, in the add-ons that those VIPs are getting outside of a closer seat to the main stage or to the presentation or, or whatever, um, what other experiences can be delivered to those people that are on site? But then you start thinking on people that may be not on site and still looking to deliver that type of VIP experience. I think there's unique ways that you can use technology to deliver really, really unique VIP experiences to people that aren't actually even on site on your brick and mortar side of the event um, in new ways that we've never done in the event industry before. I think uh, Alexandra said it before, like where you have uh, someone who's just accepted an award at an award show coming right off stage and then being greeted by some VIP fans in a digital fashion. Those are things that are, are relatively new in the event market, but new ways to create value and create connections for those people that are participating in a virtual fashion. And I think that's really the unique tie of like, try, just 
just thinking outside the box in totality and kind of not limiting your brain to any sort of thinking and, and, and just, oh, that would be really cool if this person could could interact or have a moment with uh, this celebrity or this key participant and and being able to push those kind of interactions and moments because those are the things people are going to take away from the event. Even if it is just a smaller pool of your 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 virtual digital audience, but if you can create those kind of really, really impactful moments for them, that's really what's going to kind of drive and keep pushing people to keep it, wanting to attend in that style for other future years. Austin, do you want to take that next? No, but I will. <laughs> you know, I, I, a lot of me, the reason why I jokingly said no. No, wait, because, that's a moderator's nightmare when you say no. I know, I think. <laughs> no, but really, that it, it's, I, I think that what, what, what makes me anxious about, Nate, what you were saying is just that I think some of those things should be reserved for more of that intimate moment. Like, I, I know, um, you know, when you see Bruno Mars or something like that in Vegas, like, he only meets 10 people before a show. That is it. That's it. And if you weren't there to physically see the show in person, you don't get to meet him and do the whole thing, you know? And I think that we got to be careful with giving it all away through virtual. Now, if that's the only re only means, you know, to an end where you have like a draft and you get to meet, you know, one of the players one on one and it's only 40 people that still has value. But I, I don't know. For me, I'm a stickler for like wanting that in-person energy. And again, that's why I, I mean, bring up when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, when I was your age, Nate, apparently, um, you know, <laughs> you know uh, it was so much different going from a film and television standpoint to like a theme park ride. I know that sounds irrelevant, but the, the level of immersion of just like smelling the space and like being physically there, I thought had so much more value. So I'm biased in saying that some experiences shouldn't be adapted for virtual and digital because it just it, it loses the reason why it's special, in my opinion. And I just want to be controversial in presenting that. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Alexander, yeah, I, Alexander, you go and then we'll give uh, Nate a chance to uh, to uh, bring his okay. give his generation more uh, credibility. <laughs> I'm teasing, so, sorry. My philosophy is really simple. I think that it's about finding out what the goals and expectations are of the client and developing like two separate kind of, I guess you could say experiences. You have the virtual experience and you have the in-person experience and they're gonna be different. Like. I'm a sucker for everything in person. I always want to touch and feel and be, but the reality of it is, is not everyone can do that right now. So to be able to right. get what their expectations are and the, their goals are and be able to assess that and create an experience that meets those goals in person and then create a separate experience basically just for virtual and you have those wow moments that you can create, whether it's, you know, like I said, the, the green room or whether it's something that you receive in a box or whether it's something that they get this value content in some sort of way that's not being delivered in person. I just think it's about custom developing something that works both in person and separately virtual and then finding a way to kind of bridge that gap and still make them feel cohesive. But they are two completely separate experiences and I don't ever want it to be where where it feels like whoever is in person is at a disadvantage or whoever is virtual now has no desire to ever go back in person. I, I Like I said earlier, it's a temporary normal, but it's still got to add these moments where people can feel engaged and connected and we give them some sort of memorable you know, moment or experience that they'll walk away still wanting more. Yeah, uh, I, on that on that note, because I complete agree completely. I, I think a lot of times when we work with the event professionals or the organizers when they are going about the planning for their event, is what is the ideal emotions that you'd like your attendees to walk away from the event? You know, what what will there be their memories? And then once you've kind of really mapped that out, how are you going to go about doing that for the virtual audience versus the in person audience? Right? Because obviously you're going to be able to have different sensory experiences, but ultimately the outcome can be consistent emotions and then you can really start to plan accordingly. So you said something, Michael, you said, how do you map that out? Ale all of you guys, how do you map that out? <laughs> I don't think that you do. I, I, if, if, if you go 10,000 feet at what experiential is, experiential took over from the ad industry where you have a passive viewership experience with print ads, billboards, and things that you can't interact with. Then we go towards digital in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? And that becomes a more a clickable based ad that guides you through an experience because all you're doing is funneling people. You put an attractive thing up, you funnel them, you funnel them, you funnel them, you get narrower and narrower. And then experiential came out in, in the early 2000s and really refined itself in 2010s. Um, as this new 
new thing where you're basically presented with an opportunity to play the game however you want. You can explore the space and you can make choices that are free. Now, of course, it's up to us as producers to drop Cheerios to get this Cheerio trail to pull you in on the path that we desire you to go through. But I think that that's a really valid question, David, that I don't plan on answering in this response, but is that how do you create a virtual experience? Because in a virtual world, and this is the hardest thing about talking to clients about how to plan stuff is, we have to build it. You can't just explore space organically. You have to build that environment virtually where you have to shoot the content in order to have it. Whereas in the event space, it was like, let's build a room and see what people want to go gravitate toward. You can't, you don't have that flexibility because you are producing a show now. Right, you're producing a show, but you're also the virtual and the live. What is the core, you know, people, some people are visual learners, some people are different types of learners. How do you plan for all of the senses to be at least opportunistically available to people? I mean, it's like, it's like how do you plan events today? It's like the basic raw question I'm trying to get an answer, which yeah. I don't really know. And I think a lot of people listening are, are, are wrestling with some of the same issues. The bigger issue, I think, than that might even just be shareability. I know that the reason why we keep telling clients to add photo booths to our virtual microsites is because it's the only shareable experience you can actually do on a on a on a virtual thing. Now, is it a great play? I don't think so. I don't think it's like, oh, a photo booth, you know. But at the same time, too, what else can you share? Let me push that back about shareability. Is it the shareability first, or is it the emotion that you're connecting that you want to share? Uh, like, how do you? We talk about emotion. Like, what is that core thing when you walk into a room and you get the goosebumps and you say, oh, my God, this is like transporting me to a different place where I want to tell everybody as a and here are the tools to share it. But how do you get to the point where you're creating the goosebumps? I was at an event. I was at the I was telling people I was at the in Washington at the uh, ballet benefit and uh, someone uh, introduced one of the one of the people at the event who happened to be this guy named William Webster, who was the former CIA, head of the CIA and the head of the FBI. And he was wearing his presidential medal of honor. And so everyone gets up and applauds that there's a hero in the room and it created this goosebump moment that no one had to pay for to create, you know? But like, what is the core of what we're looking for to connect people beyond, you know, the planned experiences? Or, or are you planning that? I'm just a question for everybody. Well, I mean, I, I think it's like the, 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 like at the core of like trying to evoke emotions is like storytelling, right? So I think it's how, whether it's a, a person presenting or speaking and, and it's the perspective and the stories that someone may bring to the experience um, that, that optimal or, or I most commonly evokes that emotion. I mean, it's, it's what what are the driving tools that actually evoke an emotion from us? Uh, in in my opinion, I think I feel that most hearing a story ab about something or the background behind someone, be it a hero or uh, someone who's overcome odds uh, in those kinds of things where those moments, however they're delivered in whatever fashion they're delivered are, are types of things that evoke actual emotional reaction so it's it's i think that's one of the like cores is is, is is storytelling in any way shape or form um in any medium that that really drives an emotional reaction or response well in your world uh nate somebody catches a football you know and he's about to have a, 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 a get a touchdown i mean it's like oh my god everything goes crazy I, you know if if you don't have any budget alexandra and michael and austin what do you do to create that connection? Is it the storytelling and is it done? How do you do it well? You want, I'll go ahead. So I, I think for me, I think that those wow moments and the impact that we create through the stories that we tell are varied based off of the client or the brand or whatever the event is. And so I think it's about learning what your demographic is and learning whether you have a room full of tech or a room full of influencers or a room full of XYZ and really narrowing in, you know, some people are mystified by beauty. Some people are mystified by philanthropy. Some people really respond to nostalgia. And I think that once you're able to really hone in on the brand's expectations and what that demographic is, you really have to custom create what that wow experience is and how your impact is to be driven really based off of who the audience is. It's so is variable. 
Based is that your discovery process? Is that your discovery process? Is that what you I do mean, normally? <laughs> my discovery process is all over the place, personally. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you'll find me literally sitting in an empty room, Indian style, on the floor, just taking it all in. And then sometimes it's going through book after book after book, reading history of, you know, different art. Um, it, it's so across the board with what works for that specific event. I remember the very first RFP we ever worked on. I literally went to the library and I was reading like art history books to try and hone in on our design. And I think that um, that's the thing with us as producers is we get to develop what our process looks like and what responds best. And I think you kind of almost learn as you go in this, you know, temporary normal of how you're able to figure out what people are responding to as well, because different people, you know, what people were responding to last April or last, you know, August are completely different to what they were responding to in November and December. It's a totally different process. And now people are aching to get out and do things. And there's still some people kind of, you know, what was said earlier about, you know, if you're introverted, you might really respond well to doing things more virtually now and finding different tools and different experiences that happen at your screen at home. So I think it's really about, um, taking the time to kind of, you know, customize the process based off of what the specific event is. But yeah, our box process to a certain extent is a good amount of R&D, a good amount of, you know, brainstorming and exploration, and then really trying to develop those unique wow moments that deliver impact. And I personally always try to add in some level of good, good and philanthropy to our, our events that when we can. Austin, do you want to take that next? And we'll then go around and then we'll start questions. Yeah. So uh, all I would say is that our industry in real life or, or virtually uh, relies on two words that I think are most important, surprise and delight, you know, cause and effect, surprise and delight. And so I would say always withhold something, you know, don't don't tell the guest everything they're going to get for it. You've got to withhold at least 10 percent of the whole show or else you're not going to you're not going to surprise anybody and you're not going to really delight them either because they'll have an expectation. And people always like when they read over the, the, the schedule of the keynote speakers always withhold something and if we're in person we call those easter eggs we always want to have like the experience that you expect with some hidden gems if you look closer or if you ex or you explore deeper or if you're a diehard fan of a tv show and you're in like this rebuilt set we always want to want to have one little teaser from a from a, an episode that only a diehard fan would know like those things i mean i got goosebumps right now saying that because i'm just thinking about like what people share with their friends. They go, oh my God, but they had this and you didn't know it unless you were there. That is everything about it. And you can do that in a virtual space um, by, by, by having just interesting connections and, and oh my gosh, it's so-and-so, you know? And I think this is important to always withhold at least 10% of your show um, to bring a surprise and delight moment to the, to the guests. Is that a rule? Is that an Austin rule? Uh, that is an Austin rule that we always have to have at least three Easter eggs in a production. Like we're not like no one here is allowed to produce something unless there's at least three Easter eggs hidden in a project. Um, yeah. and if there's not make, you know, figure it out. Do you know, those are the key learnings that people will take away from something like this, Michael and Nate, and then we're going to go to questions. If you have any comments on what's been said to date. Yeah, of course. I think that the motions all get driven often by the storytelling. Um, so it is important to kind of think about what that story is you want to tell. Uh, but it's even more uh, important if you can incorporate the audience into that storytelling in some manner. And I know, Austin, you shared, uh, you know, something that you guys were doing recently, I think, uh, that really starts to incorporate and, and bring the audience in. And we do a lot of corporate events. So let's just say it was a product launch or some sort of uh, brand messaging. Obviously, ideally, there's a story that you do want to tell um, and, and incorporating the employees into either unique exercises or to, um, you know, unique experiences or formats that like incorporate them into that creation of the story or telling the story. It creates engagement and it creates like emotional connection. And then uh, a lot of times they leave the event feeling way more inspired or connected to the brand. So yeah. incorporate the, the audience into your story as best as possible. Nate, Nate. Comment yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think what all three of, uh, what all, well, really, what everyone has said on, on that front, with with regards to kind of that that last piece of obviously from the storytelling perspective to connecting with people, and, and I think really it really comes back to understanding what what are we trying to elicit from the audience, um, and and then figuring out creative ways to get to that endpoint, um, and I think that's really kind of at the core of what we've 
discuss is really we need to understand what we're trying to do before we can go ahead and do it. And, and I think that that's something that's, that's really, really important in the process is, is kind of sometimes we try to dive right into something really deep from the get go when really we should be taking a minute to like kind of take that 10,000 step right. view, yeah. understand what we're trying to do and then move forward. The way I read it, we're trying to figure out what what book are people in your audience taking out from the library and then discuss it, as opposed to like having a completely different uh, book uh, that nobody wants. Let's go to questions. Here's one. We've talked about this a bit, but if people can give us sort of like, how can they advise people? The question is, how can you ensure that moving towards hybrid events, the attendees that stay at home for whatever reason don't have FOMO, fear of missing out, and feel included as the person, the people in person. We've talked about that a lot, but is there one piece of advice that you'll give to a planner on how to incorporate them in condensing maybe some things that you've said? Uh, get it to the Easter egg concept. <laughs> uh, Alexander, yeah. you wanna start? Sure, um, I think that it's kind of what we touched on before. You wanna be able to paint a picture for those at home that gives them something that maybe they're not getting in person so they feel like they have this added value of being at home and they can still feel connected. But I think at the same time, you, you don't wanna give them everything to the point that they don't feel the need to come back in real life. So I think it's about developing kind of like a side set of moments that are specifically catered to the virtual audience to where they can feel connected and they can feel engaged. And at the same time, maybe some of those, you know, Easter eggs or moments that, that we do deliver, we curate in a way where they also spark this desire for more, leading them to want to return in real person for, you know, hopefully what will be, I would say, 2022, right, <laughs> you I'm know. Gonna, I'm gonna go to Nate uh, to surprise everybody. Nate, you go next. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I think I think that definitely is, is that factor is, is I think there's importance to to provide unique experiences to both kind of audiences, um, but not take away from either side at the same token, which I think is a tricky kind of world to traverse and figure out what really makes the most sense. But I think I think that's really at the core of kind of what we talked about in totality and that question in particular. This is going to wrap up too. Michael, what do you think in terms of this? Uh, well, I think Austin most likely will agree with me but that you do want to create the FOMO still. Like you do want to really paint a picture of how amazing it is to be uh, in person. Uh, I think a lot of times even like with movies and storytelling, uh, that, that example of Jurassic Park, I was watching that movie and yes, it's scary at moments, but I actually wanted to be at that park. You know, it seemed like it was craziness. Um, so, but I do think also, of course, for the virtual audience, you do have to have something that is specified for them. Maybe not as great as what might be going on in person, but really give them a, a different view or a different content or a different experience of connection perhaps um, should be focused on. Austin? Well, you kind of captured my point there, Michael, about like creating different levels. And I think I mentioned it earlier, uh, just as I want to create quick takeaways for the audience, too, is that don't worry about it. Stop overthinking it. I mean, you, there's there's cheap seats in a concert and there's nice seats in a concert and there's pit seats in a concert. And having a virtual audience versus the in-person audience, it's OK to have different levels. But you have to be really honest about it with your client and just say, look. It's not the same thing. We're going to withhold some stuff. Or if you want to do something that's what I've been doing all year. I know, Alex, you've done it all year. I think everybody else kind of has is you can do the mailer thing that accompanies it. I know I've done a lot of broadcast studio premieres with an unboxing experience and the broadcast that happens at home. I know that the audience has already seen that and has already been told that. But that's a way to, I guess, get closer to e equal experiences, right? But again, to Michael, that to your point, I agree fully that I, I think there's a different tiers of experiences. And I believe that... The virtual experience is the nosebleed seats, and I believe that the in-person is, uh, you know, front row. So that's, I think we've, this has been a capturing of a lot of our thinking. Uh, there's a question, I think this is for Michael. Um, what platforms um, do allow people to speak or ask questions more than just a chat box? I mean, I believe that a lot of times these, these virtual platforms need to go a little bit beyond uh, the simple participatory uh, functions. What do you see as the future of participation in virtual? 
What I think, Ada, we see it a little bit with Symphony that the audience is in now, where a lot of times, even if it's the same exact broadcast, you have all these like, kind of like micro rooms or watch parties that are beginning for the same exact session. So that's kind of already here and happening quite a bit. And I do love seeing that format. But I would think if you had a, a thousand people just in one single session in the Symphony, um, it, which is being uh, recently updated to be fully powered by Zoom's video and audio, you can have a hundred concurrent audio streams. So I think being able to have like maybe side conversations or side chatter sometimes in different groups watching the same exact broadcast would be really, really nice. Or just you know asking the questions through audio without having to bring people up on screen all the time. Small things that I think will you know bring a little bit more of the senses of listening and hearing someone's voice rather than just asking the question. Was that an introvert speaking? Yeah, it might. Be, yeah. I might just type my question rather than jump on the audio. <laughs> because there, you know the people that want to sit in the front row and the people that want to sit in the back. I mean, you, we're dealing with so many different types of people. I think that the idea is how do you make people feel comfortable? And you know, every time I have one of these conversations, it also comes down to that Maya Angelou quote <laughs> about people don't remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Um, with that said. Um, Michael, we're going to turn it over to you for a little bit of uh, demo on Cadence, but I really want to thank everybody for being on this panel because we are in the process of creating the world in real time. And, and hearing everybody, I mean, I've learned tons just from hearing uh, the nuggets of things that you're saying. And those are the things, I mean, the Easter egg thing, I'm going to use all the time. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it's how we help each other communicate that sense of simplicity. And I think that what Austin was saying is that we're yearning for simplicity uh, in ways that we've never yearned for. Like just at the events I went to, just the fact of, of shaking hands was an unbelievable intimate act that we finally appreciate. And, and so we're, this, we're entering this whole new era that is actually starting today. And that's what's so exciting about what we're doing. Now we have these new canvases like what that Michael created that is going to expand what we do and bring more people into the fold to come to our live events and come to our and come to our virtual events. And you don't have to have a hybrid event where you have one one event that's live and and one event that that's virtual. They could be separate because there are people that learn in different ways. And I think that there's audiences for everything. And that all we've done is expand our canvas. Uh, and and as, as Nate said about 100 times, we have to think out of the box. And it, that is a cliche, but literally, we have to think out of the box. So with that, I want to thank everybody and turn it over to Michael. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so what we'll be going uh, over today in the demo is something very, very specific to today's conversation. Um, how can you create some of that um, emotional engagement um, so that a, an attendee kind of really feels um, understood of, of why they are coming to the event in the first place, uh, whether it is a corporate event where they might be forced to be going to the event uh, or when it is a conference and it's either free ticketing or paid ticketing, those individuals are coming to the event uh, with a specific intention. So uh, what we are looking at here is the um, emotionally engaging attendees in the new era uh, of events um, from BizBash. Uh, what I wanted to bring up is an event that is coming uh, this Tuesday, which is our first ever consumer event to the world, uh, which is called the Cadence Collective. I, I won't load the fire festival that was there for a second. Uh, but this event is focused um, on the collective industry of event professionals, event organizers, event planners, um, the production companies, experiential agencies, and all the ways in which we are combined together as a collective to put on these world-class events. And uh, there's a lot of different perspectives, of course, uh, that comes from each of those parties, uh, the organizers, the planners, the producers, the agencies, the event technologists, and uh, how can we understand the perspectives the thought process that goes through into each one of those. How can we develop trust across each of those wonderful groups um, to be able to put on incredible events? And one aspect of when you are doing registration or when you are doing attendee surveying 
or when you were onboarded into this event within Cadence are all of these you know, topics of interest, why you are here at an event. Now, this is a Cadence event, so it's going to be much more, uh, you know, maybe ridiculous in some of the topics of interest, but this can also be quite fascinating when you really do open it up to understand why your um, attendees are part joining the event. Often an event organizer may pre-populate a lot of these, um, or you also may enable it so that attendees may add their own. That we strongly recommend because one, just the, the data and the analytics of like understanding what your audience is interested in, you know, sometimes that relates just to the professional um, development of the event based upon what the topics are. But we also love when it opens up to other things like uh, my love for Mezcal or Nicolas Cage or um, pet raccoons, right? So there's some ridiculousness here there. But a, a lot of times I think it is important that even if this event is based upon inbound marketing and that is the sole focus of it, can I still uh, connect with people over shared interests that might relate to uh, meditation or health and wellness um, or certain other aspects, right? now? the ability to kind of have these understandings from your registration where maybe you are doing industry or job role or um, professional career or region, all these different aspects that are easy to fill out in registration without making it lengthy can then allow you to actually start to curate the event experience a little bit. So in this collective event, for instance, when I go to see all the people that are here, you know, immediately all the recommended connections for me. One, so that I can spark a conversation with that individual or spark a conversation with the group um, or jump into video conversations or schedule a meeting or meetups so that Zach and I can go get Mezcal once the last session is over. That's one aspect of how can I begin to understand the intentions and the purpose of why this attendee is here not just to recommend the people are here that are connections and the groups and the conversation, but also perhaps recommend the sessions or the tracks or the experiences that are occurring at the event that are best suited for me, or perhaps recommend the content to consume based upon who I am as an individual, or perhaps recommend the companies to go visit, You know, whether those are sponsors or exhibitors or partners I might be at this event because I'm interested in learning this subject or topic, which might relate to the services or the products or the brands that that company is offering. Those are ways that you can really start to curate and personalize the experience, which does start to lead to, I'm having an experience as an attendee that feels like it is beginning to understand why I'm here in the first place understood, acknowledged, um, it starts to develop a lot of that empathy, which does begin to create the emotional experience and therefore the memories, which can relate to brand loyalty, um, telling all their friends about this event that they experienced. Another thing that I really wanna highlight within Cadence that you heard from a lot of the panelists today is the importance of you know really highlighting a, a sensory experience. Of course, you have uh, significantly more control of that when you are in person. But when you have virtual events and or you have the incredible app experience for those that are in person, you want to make sure that the platform uh, keeps as much of that wonderful branding and energy and excitement. So when you're choosing a platform, a large part of that is can it convey the brand in not just the beautiful imagery, but perhaps the animations in the videos, in the integrated experience that happens within it. Uh, I know Austin's not the biggest fan of the virtual photo booth, but important that it can be directly within your event with the full same branding, even though this is a separate platform directly integrated within Cadence. The audience doesn't know that, right? So it's really, really important that it feels like a singular event experience it feels and looks like the brand no matter what. That is a huge component of one, creating an emotional connection to the brand, um, two, using imagery, animations, video, colors to again, heighten the, the, the senses because events are incredibly energetic and exciting. And I think too often um, 
You've seen it when sometimes it's just a meeting link in your Outlook or your Google Calendar, you know, or some of the other platforms out there don't necessarily really kind of um, make the brand really feel alive or make you really excited for what this event is that's upcoming. And that's a huge component of it. Um, so I really wanted to be able to highlight that in particular uh, when we kind of go through this demo. Here, this is the kind of home screen lobby. So really nice that you can have the kind of look and feel. But another thing that's a hugely important component, I find with most event technologies, unfortunately, you know, when you go to any other platform on web or app, separate from the events industry, almost every single one um, is a curated experience in some way. You know, of course, Amazon is, Netflix is, Instagram, all of these other either social sites or e-commerce sites um, or media and entertainment sites, they are more personalized and curated for you based on who you are. So these are the same things that we want to bring to the event experience, which we don't think happens too often because it's so often thought about as a one-off experience, just that one singular annual conference or festival. Um, one, it doesn't have to be that way, right? Because you're seeing more and more um, of Cadence and other platforms really try to embrace a 365 ex uh, community or customer engagement experience or employee experience. So you do start to learn a lot of the behavior and the, the needs and intentions of those audience members to curate it. But even when it's a singular event, like we've done here, you have all of the abilities to link to every experience that's going on at your event, whether it's happening you know, uh, directly within Cadence or external. So this can mean um, segmenting if you want to, or I guess in better words, curating the in-person experience for those that are logging into the web or app when uh, live on site, or the virtual experience for those that are attending uh, virtually, or VIP tickets versus regular tickets, or based upon global regions, industry, any of the kind of clear information that you're already traditionally capturing in registration, start to curate it. So my personalized schedule or building my own adventure or build out my profile or linking to the competitions that are going or the speakers or um, exclusive content just for the virtual audience, exclusive content just for the uh, in-person audience or based upon my global region or based upon other criteria, right? it starts to personalize the experience along with the recommendations of the people to connect with, the sessions to attend. Um, I think that's a critical component because it's the first thing your audience often sees separate from your registration and your, like, your, your announcement emails is that open up the app, open up the website. What does this event feel like? What does the brand feel like? And how does it understand what my needs are? Schedule, very straightforward. If you are either going to be doing a uh, you know, single track event, multi-track event, uh, within Cadence we support um, unlimited number of concurrent sessions, unlimited number of breakouts, tracks. Uh, you can get incredibly complex with your events where applicable when you do have 64 different breakouts occurring at one given time with the different groups. Can do full registration, of course, uh, with waiting lists um, as well. You can um, obviously take any single thing within the platform, such as your menu items or anything within any of the menu items to determine, is this visible to the entire audience or just to specific groups and or just for specific attendees? Another nice way to, one, when you have to make certain content private, but two, to be able to curate it accordingly uh, where applicable. Uh, really nice for uh, a lot of the kind of ways that you might want to personalize or curate the experience. Uh, full resource distribution, a huge component, of course, when it was in person and or hybrid presentations, PDFs, videos, podcasts, surveys, certifications, linking out to any other platform, most of which often get embedded as well. So you can kind of use what we call collections within Cadence to distribute all of your content leading up to the event, throughout the event, after the event. Uh, we do not restrict when you use our platform when you choose to open your event, because a lot of times you do want to start building that excitement and that hype one week out, two weeks out. 
uh, as an example, or perhaps you want to keep the event open afterwards for further connections, accessing the on-demand content, seeing all the wonderful photos and videos and moments that were captured at, at the event as well too. Huge component of what we really want to be able to do in regards to sparking conversation and connecting people is, you know, one, the ability to have like your direct messaging one-on-one -on -one or group-based private or public within any given uh, event, you know, very similar to a lot of the inspiration that we take from wonderful platforms like Slack, but also, you know, your, your social wall or your live feed, really important to be able to capture all of the moments. One, one the hype and the excitement um, and the energy leading up to the event. This is often when people are either in person or virtual, sharing, you know, either the, the virtual viewing experience or the travel to the site on uh, what is the venue experience like when you first walk in. Really great way to be capturing a lot of those moments, to be connected to a lot of the attendees. And then it's sharing a lot of the moments throughout the event. And this is where, uh, again, whether it's virtual or in person, whether it's purely word sentiment analysis of what they loved with the threaded conversations and the likes and um, or it is more of the video capture of the in-person experience. Um, really nice that you can kind of have that gallery at the end for all of those captured moments, but also utilizing all of your emotions and gifts and polls and at mentioning anything that might be going on at the event, such as at mentioning other attendees and connections, or perhaps men uh, at mentioning some of the other um, schedule items or materials Feeling connected to each other is incredibly important. Feeling connected to what's going on at the event is really important. So whether that's the at mentioning that occurs within the messaging or the live feed, or when you send out communications and it can connect and link to anything that's in your event, incredibly important for creating that connection and then also just driving engagement in the areas of the event that you really like. We really wanna focus everywhere within the platform um, to make it have that energy and the excitement and really being able to convey your brand. So here, you know, really taking the Cadis Collective brand and having it cascade through the entire experience, um, but really bringing a lot of life to all the wonderful people that are here, you know, in their branded banners or in their embedded video with the full biographies, what they are speaking at, along with all the resources that either speakers or companies may want to really hi highlight because it's really important even if you are paying the speakers or uh the the sponsors are kind of a sponsor in kind you really want to also still be able to promote everything that they want to offer so that's really nice to be able to do that um, as you go through either the kind of great speaker profiles and speaker web pages or you're going through that kind of like exhibit hall or brand showroom to see all of the incredible companies uh, that are here that then can have as well their full um, branded showroom with, again, their branded banner or embedded video, an overview of the entire company, the people representing um, that company uh, as well. Uh, nice kind of examples of really being able to highlight uh, visually and in important information for all of the great companies that are here. Uh, and now you guys kind of already had the experience within Symphony um, in regards to a setup that is like a broadcast style with like webinars, but you may use Symphony like Cadence is the overall platform for the entire event experience leading up to the event, throughout the event, long after the event for the community building, resource distribution, a lot of the social conversation, um, the other embedded experiences as part of your event. Symphony is our uh, virtual uh, platform within Cadence. Uh, think of Symphony uh, as an alternative to your, your hop-ins or you run the world um, as some of those examples, um, your brand lives perhaps. Now within Symphony, we wanted to create this so that you could have one single Symphony that can be broadcast style with pre-recorded video, with live, um, audio and video powered by Zoom within Symphony, uh, along with other embeddable experiences. So rather than having people have to go into multiple different platforms, being able to have an integrated experience for the ease of your attendees and your speakers and your producers, 
uh, and your sponsors, as well as being able to kind of have all the incredible like engagement that you'd like. When you create these, you can determine, do I want to have like the full timeline of all of the content or the studio settings that I want to be bringing into the symphony at any given point? Do I want to have the full list of participants? Do I want messaging for the entire audience or just hosts and moderators with the photos and the gifts and the text? Do I want to have breakouts where we allow up to 500 concurrent breakouts? Um, a lot of times people pre-schedule the breakouts, but a lot of times you want the format of you want a thousand people to join, then break them out like randomized or manually by person or group, bring them back, discuss what happened during the breakouts, send them back to the same breakouts. So nice that you're able to kind of facilitate that either pre-scheduled or directly from within the symphony. Do you want the up, uh, ask a question with the upvoting or anonymous? Do you want note taking so that anytime I hear anything informative, insightful, great professional or uh, personal development, capture those notes so they live within my attendee profile to access afterwards with the context of where I took them? Do I want this to be purely webinar style? Do I want this to be with the, all the participants also being able to be part of this, to be called on and off stage and on and off audio? And then do I want to preload any content, which could be presentation slides, pre-recorded videos, embedded, you know, B-mix into uh, yeah, a Vimeo uh, or a, you know, anytime it's a Vimeo or YouTube or any other kind of immersive experience that you want to embed, being able to either embed or preload content. And that's what kind of leads to these, um, what the experience was that you were just uh, directly inside uh, Symphony for. Uh, so as I kind of went over a kind of high level overview of some of the look and feel of the platform with the main intentions that we really want to be able to convey, uh, I think either John or Ian may be uh, in uh, the symphony uh, for any asked questions that may have uh, come in. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we will make the entire panel discussion that happened today, as well as this kind of um, contextual overview of the uh, Biz Bash event and our upcoming Tuesday Cadence Collective will be available uh, on demand as recordings that we will send out um, one within the event that you attended today, uh, but then also emailed directly to you as well. Um, so I wanted to thank you all so much for your time for attending today's discussion uh, and for uh, joining us as well as uh, getting a sneak peek of uh, the full platform of Cadence.